Hello, hello. I'm uh, testing my talks for the AGU meeting in Washington next week. That's the American Geophysical Union meeting. And uh, so I thought I may as well record it. So I'd like to talk a bit about the Iceland situation right now on the Reykjans Peninsula and the ongoing eruptions. And let me share my screen. So I hope you can see that now. So we're talking about the Fagradarsfjall and the Sundnuka fires, i.e. the sequence of eruptions. And the big question I'm trying to answer today is, do we have a single magma reservoir or a complicated magma supply system, a complicated plumbing system? I acknowledge my co-authors here. They all have helped enormously. And... Uh, the situation on the Reykjans Peninsula is uh, that we have these episodes of eruptions. This has been going on for several thousand years, large gaps, quiescence, and then followed by intense periods of eruptions along several of the volcanic lineaments there. The um, period prior to the current cycle of eruptions uh, was that there was no activity for some 800 years, 815 years, and then in 21, the eruption sequence kicked off again. And the Fagradarsfjall hadn't been active for some 3,000 years, but the other volcanoes there, they were. And of course, now we have a sequence of 10 eruptions within only three years. And here's a map. We see the uh, Geldingadali, Meradali, and Little Rutter of the Fagradarsfjall events, and then we have the Sundnuker. The map is not entirely up to date because it's actually changed as we speak, because there is an eruption going on, but you get the idea. So these are pretty close to each other, but a few kilometers apart. Now here's the timeline, Geldingadale in 21, took 180 days, and then Meradali and Little Ruta, uh, 22 and 23, were a little faster. Sundnuker started December 23, and there was a whole series of little eruptions. There is a few little cones missing on the top. I'll update them when I have a few minutes, but the eruption sequence is actually so fast, it's quite astonishing. And as you probably realize, the lavas have reached the Blue Lagoon, at least the outer perimeter of the Blue Lagoon, held back by the lava berms right now. So what is the key question here? The key question is, uh, is it a multiple uh, reservoir system or a single reservoir? And if it's a single one, how big is it? So um, there we also would want to know is not only the size, but actually how deep is it? What's the time it will require for magma to come up from depth to the surface? That's one of the crucial questions. I'm putting up three hypotheses here, the lower one, um, the block diagrams, and the initial hypotheses uh, put up was by Halderson and team that uh, the magma rises directly from the mantle. Later, uh, studies have been a bit more skeptical about that initial idea, and uh, there could be a complicated plumbing system, or older work have suggested that in previous episodes there may even have been a large system under the entire peninsula, and that would imply there could be magma under Reykjavik, which wouldn't be good news. So we sampled these lavas for quite some time and it's still ongoing. So it's quite an effort because there's so many eruptions. And um, this is the initial paper we published. This spans about 180 days. And what we see initially in the geochemistry is that there were some changes. It's a bit messy at the beginning and then it peters out into a continuous chemical signal. This, of course, is something we continued over the subsequent years. And here, Mera Dalia is in green and uh, Little Ruto in blue and Sundnuka in red. And um, the um, initial December 23 Sundnuk eruption seems to be a direct continuation of the Fagradals uh, eruptives. So that's good news because it means it's the same lava for all we can tell. This is consistent with the mineral data that I'm showing here. This is olivine trace element data. And you can see in red the macro crystals and in pink the micro crystals. And the macro crystals overlap rather well with uh, the previous uh, Fagradals Fiatl eruptives and the microcrystals are continuation. So uh, there's a good case to be made that it's the same type of magma that's erupting. And um, this initial idea about uh, the plumbing system is, of course, something that, as I said later, authors have questioned. And here is the work by Radu et al. They did mineral melt barometry and 
the bulk of the crystals that they analyzed comes from about, well, maybe seven to 12 kilometers depth. And it does continue down to 15 where the Moho is located, but uh, it's not at all a direct mantle supply because obviously we need to store magma in the crust in order to grow these crystals. And um, this, of course, means that uh, there is a big question mark. Bindemans et al. model put a sill complex into the lower crust above the Moho, and that's a very attractive idea. But it would also mean that uh, there may be a contamination signal because magma that resides in the crust for longer would uh, actually interact with the crust. And we just published this work here, and this is Day et al., and uh, there we see that the initial eruptives in Geldinger Dahlia in 21 have very radiogenic osmium. That's a clear crustal input and actually the most radiogenic of all fresh lavas in Iceland known to date. And that implies that before the eruption, these magmas were stored for a little while in the crust and they have interacted with the crust. So that's interesting, meaning the direct mantle supply is not so good, but we still don't exactly know where this magma reservoir sits. So if you have a medical problem and you think there's something going on, you do a, a CT scan. And of course, for the earth, we do a seismic tomography. So this is based on earthquakes from 2019 to 2024. The work is mainly done by my colleague Ari Trukvason at Uppsala. And it measures the difference between the VP and VS ratios. As we all know, the VS ratios are not going through liquids. So the higher the VP um, uh, relative to the VS ratio, the more likely we have fluid down there. And indeed, we are seeing an anomaly here. So here we have a big anomaly actually sitting right under Fagredalsfjatl and earthquake swarms in the last year are given here in different colors. <clears throat> and uh, there is an earthquake sequence here and a large one under Sundnuker now as well. So we actually have a depth for the magma reservoir and that's really good. And this depth is nine to 12 kilometers. There is a resolution breakdown below. So this could continue a little deeper and there could even be a reservoir at the Moho, but there is a large reservoir in between, and that must be the reservoir that feeds upwards. And the earthquakes clearly mark the path of the uh, magma ascent. And um, this gives us a clear indication that we are dealing with a more complex plumbing system, but not a directly mantle fed one. And in fact, um, Sorry, I forgot. If we do a little calculations, if we take the uh, anomaly and calculate the potential fluid content from the size of the reservoir, then uh, there may be up to 50,000 cubic kilometers in that reservoir. But let's all relax because only a tiny fraction of that will actually ever make it to the surface. So we also have new data. And uh, now there seems to be some changes after the December eruption at Sundnuka, which seemed to be very similar in composition. There is now some changes. The magma is becoming more evolved that is erupting. And uh, that means we have more storage. So the magma is stored for some time, likely in multiple chambers. And the last one is, of course, the holding chamber just under um, Swartz Engi. And indeed, fractionation will take place. And we have different uh, parameters. Here is also delta 18O. And uh, the Sundnuker samples, they seem to go a little lower, which is consistent with assimilation of a low delta 18O component, which is typical for the upper crust. So the magmas at Sundnuker are likely stored for a little while in the upper crust before they erupt. So coming back to this, I think uh, this one is certainly not working, although it's a beautiful idea, but it's sad to let it go. This one here is not entirely wrong, but it's not entirely right either. I think the reality is that uh, we're talking about a major system at nine to 12 kilometers depth. We published that in Terra Nova earlier this year. And uh, well, we used a very careful title. If you look at the media, they come with a much more punchy title like this one here. So according to them, we have identified the hotbed of volcanic activity. But I think you get the drift. Um, this is a good indication that we don't have a large system under Reykjavik. So high resolution temporal sampling gives us some good ideas here. Evidence for crustal storage is actually quite strong. 
the large reservoir at 9 to 12 could host up to 50,000 kilometers, cubic kilometers of magma. Neither Fagradosviertel nor Sundnuker is directly fed from the mantle. There's holding chambers on the way. So we need to be a little mindful with shooting too fast when it comes to these models. The good news is no magma under Reykjavik. And uh, this is, of course, uh, good. And the issue is that in detail, this is very complicated because multi-chamber uh, or multi-reservoir plumbing systems are, of course, a little messy in the eruptive products. And um, finally, just to close off, using Major and Tracelman geochemistry and seismic tomography helps us to rule out this large-scale system. And that means it's positive. So we don't have a Reykjans Peninsula-wide system. We propose a single major chamber that shoots up into smaller pockets. And this allows then for further differentiation in these smaller pockets. So I say thank you very much for your time. And uh, let me unshare. And uh, I hope you found this interesting. So there is hope, but uh, there is also a lot of work to be done because it is complex in detail. And it's not a simple plumbing system with a direct uh, elevator from the mantle. This is not how it looks like, according to at least our data. Thank you very much. All the very best.